Welcome to S Talk. This is Jesse. Today we are grateful to have Dr. Kirsty Kido to share with us how XAPI enables analytics for connected learning beyond the LMS. This is a project sponsored by Australian government, and Dr. Kido is the lead investigator for this project. She is a senior research fellow at Queensland University of Technology. Her research domain is about how humans interact with complex information environments, especially in the interdependencies between language, attitudes, memory, and learning. Sounds very interesting. Dr. Kido, please share with us. Hi, everyone. Um, I'll just talk about our project today. Uh, so the, Jesse has asked me to talk about um, how we're using XAPI to enable the, the analytics that we're developing, and in particular, analytics aimed at uh, enabling connected learning for learning beyond the learning management system. So uh, this, this project, as Jesse was saying, it's quite a large project. It involves a collaboration between a number of different investigators at a number of different universities. Uh, and it's about one year in, so we've got one more year to run. So we, we're at the point now where we have, um, we, we have the toolkit up and running. We've been starting some trials and we've been um, starting to develop the, the next round of um, analytics and dashboards. So we're mm -hmm. just starting to think about what we're going to do uh, in the future. Mm -hmm. So I might start with the question of, well, why would you actually do any kind of learning analytics in the wild? Um, mm -hmm. There's a few reasons uh, that were motivating this project when we started it. Um, so the first question, well, the first response would be, actually, this is where all our students are. So if you, for example, generate a, um, uh, oh, okay. So, so for example, if you um, create a group project and you get all of your students forming into a group, um, quite often what I would see in the classroom is they'll all sit there around a table and they'll exchange Facebook accounts, and they'll <laughs> right. like, they'll be off in Facebook um, mm -hmm. managing their group project. Which means that if you assume that your analytics system, which is maybe enabled by a learning management system, is capturing all of their interactions, you've lost most of the data that was very important to what you were actually trying to step or what you were trying to measure. So for example, at TUT we use Blackboard and Blackboard will give our students access to um, wiki, wiki pages, group discussion forum, um, file share services, a whole heap of stuff. But what we find is our students are off um, on Facebook, they're using Dropbox, maybe they're using Google Drive, maybe they're using um, Facebook, uh, Twitter, whatever, like they're using a whole heap of different social media tools. And so we just lose them. We wouldn't have any idea of what they were doing. And that's a problem because sometimes you need to know uh, if the group is in trouble. Um, sometimes you also need to know who, who was actually um, participating in the activity or who was having difficulty. And sometimes mm -hmm. you don't find out any of this until everything's in a really bad situation and you have to go in and actually um, help help the group actually navigate through some really quite nasty arguments about mm -hmm. who was actually contributing. So we have a lot of teachers at QUT who actually teach in the world anyway. So they, they actually use a lot of standard social media environments uh, to, to teach just because of this problem. So they're, they're actually trying to engage with the students in the places where they are. So I've got two of them here. One's Mandy Lupton. So she's actually involved in this project as an investigator. And this other one is Kate Davis. She does an awful lot of teaching using quite innovative WordPress setups that involve quite often Twitter um, chats, a whole heap of things like that. And they've both been doing this teaching in the wild for, for years. So th this is the cohort of teachers we're trying to support with this project. Mm -hmm. um, Kate Davis was actually the first person to trial out the toolkit. So this semester we've been running a, a trial with one of their classes and we can discuss um, that a little bit later. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the second answer is I, I actually genuinely believe that um, learning is heading towards sort of wild open spaces. So instead of actually offering as an educational institution a nice big learning management system that gives us all the functionality we need, um, really what we need is a lot of small loosely joined solutions and so different instructors can pull together the different things that they actually want to use in their teaching rather than having to rely on one standalone system. Right. Um, and the reason I think this is happening is because in the end we're heading towards 
a situation of lifelong personalised learning. Um, and as we move into a period of disruption and employment change and um, demographic changes where people are having to having to retrain and upskill and reskill throughout their lifetime, it's going to become more and more important that we can offer people real world uh, learning scenarios where they're actually really dis they're, they're connected with the real world situations in which they're actually trying to learn how what. Well, Okay, so they, they need to be yeah. connected with the real world situations that yeah, they're actually the trying world. to learn how to deal with. Um, yeah, so yes, yeah, so the the motivation for the project is to really help us push into these real world learning experiences. Mm -hmm. um, so a fairly standard use case that we designed this project for would be something like a, a capstone project, which is normally at QUT run in third year and um, will involve quite often a group work component. So normally you'll have maybe five students all working together. You'll have one student who does a fair bit of project management quite often via Facebook. So they'll be in Facebook bossing the whole group around. You'll mm -hmm. have maybe in an IT project a couple of students who are very good at programming and so they'll be developing the, the code base that the students will be um, submitting at the end of their project. And you'll maybe have another student who's not so good at coding but um, can maybe write quite good web pages or documentation and so the, the sort of help documents and things like that will be written by that student. Mm -hmm. And so the, the question that often arises for us at the end of all of that is, well, who contributed to the team? So did, did they all contribute equally and should the marks be shared equally or were mm -hmm. maybe a couple of students very um, working very hard and should they actually get the majority of the mark and maybe there was one student who didn't do any work at all, in which case it would be nice to know about that. Right. And quite often we don't find out about this until everything falls apart and there's a big argument and we have to go in and do damage control. So really what you'd like to do is find out who was contributing in real time before right. problems arise so that you can actually as an instructor go and intervene if there's any problems emerging. It also means potentially you can help the students to actually achieve better group work skills um, because you can actually sort of push them towards better better roles and better behaviours if you know what they're doing as, as they go. Uh -huh. So the, the solution we came up with um, is all about helping students to understand their own behaviour. So we, we need to help students to understand what it is, um, how they're contributing. <laughs> we, we need to help students understand how they're contributing and what their actual behaviour is in these kinds of complex scenarios that are spread across multiple platforms. Uh -huh. Right. So to do that, we use learning analytics. Um, this is a definition for learning analytics that comes from the SOLAR definition. So this is the Society for Learning Analytics Research. Mm -hmm. um, right. And the idea is that you're actually um, using data to actually understand learners in their context and using that data to improve, to improve learning outcomes. But mm -hmm. the problem with learning analytics, at, at least as far as I understand it, a lot, a lot of the work that's been um, going on in learning analytics has been centred around understanding the learners, but it's not really for the learners. So mm -hmm. there's very little, there's very little data that actually gets returned to the learners that teaches right. them about their own behaviour. And so right. one of the key emphases of this project is to actually try and teach learners about their own behaviour. Um, rather mm. than actually giving a whole heap of reports to the academics and the institution about their behaviour. We want to yeah. return the data to the learners and help them understand their own um, help them understand yeah. their own processes in real time. The project is aiming to develop what's called the Connected Learning Analytics Toolkit. And we, we use Experience API um, as mm -hmm. a, a core component for for this project. So so what we do um, schematically is we um, interface with uh, standard social media APIs to pull data from, say, YouTube or from Facebook or from Twitter, from from a, a number of different sources. We make sure that this data is actually stored using a common vocabulary. So we've actually put uh -huh. a lot of effort into developing a series of recipes that help us to actually aggregate the data from multiple sources of social media into a, a common a common format. Yeah. Um, so once we've done that, that means that we can apply things like semantic technologies or a number of different sort of analytical techniques to that data 
um, at a high level aggregate level or at a lower level fine grained level. So we can, for example, analyze just contributions to a YouTube channel or we could look at YouTube plus Twitter plus Facebook contributions. So we, we mm. can describe the, the data in a, a common format. And that then means that we can develop a number of different reports um, that are contextualized for different roles within the institution. So for example, students see a certain set of data academics see other um, other reports and admin and developers can then see the cohort level kind of reporting for the for everyone using the toolkit right um, so an example of that just to get you understanding what's going on in the process would be students will volunteer um, what well, students will actually sign up to data collection so we don't just automatically go and collect their data um, and this is actually one of the strengths of this project. Um, because I think when you're going to work into the social media space, you, you need to be very respectful of students and not just take all of their data. We only need right. to take the data that actually pertains to the learning events that they're participating in. So right. what students, mm -hmm. and also because we're using social media accounts, there's no guarantee that the student, um, we, we will know the student's username for that social media account. So the student has to actually supply us with information, for example, their Facebook ID or their um, Google username, things like that, before we can even um, collect the data that pertains to that, that particular learner. So they, they volunteer the information that relates to their learning, their learning event. They see an ethics statement. They, they hopefully think about it and read that. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, then essentially that means we'll collect specific data relating to a specific learning event. So for example, we'll collect um, a whole heap of Twitter data relating to one particular hashtag. So here we might be collecting the CLA test um, data that, well, um, so here for example, we might be collecting any data that has a CLA test hashtag associated with it in Twitter. Mm -hmm. That data then gets stored in a um, XAPI statement and using our common recipe, which I'll discuss in a little minute and then we can pull that out and do some sort of analytics on it. So here we've got a cognitive presence um, indicator which would tell a student how much triggering versus exploration versus everything else they're doing in in some particular activity format. Mm -hmm. so, um, one of the one of the real key questions that we've had to deal with for this project is the concept of controlled vocabularies and linking data across multiple different contexts. So because we're trying to aggregate the data from multiple sources, we've, we've had to put a lot of work into controlled vocabularies and recipes in particular. Um, but there's some other things that we've been thinking about a lot lately, and that's to do with data portability. So if I'm motivating this project using personalized lifelong learning, it becomes important that the data makes sense across multiple contexts and multiple institutions. So one of the things we've been thinking a lot about lately is how you can actually guarantee that data collected in one learning scenario can be mapped to a different institutional scenario. Um, mm -hmm. So for example, a, a student might start off in um, primary school collecting a whole heap of learning data about their, their participation in primary school and then map through to a high school and actually um, still have that data making sense in this new institution and then take that data with them to university and then on into the professional world. Mm -hmm. So this, this learning data can be very powerful if, if students have access to it and I think we, we should be doing a lot of work there. Um, yeah. We also need much more sophisticated um, data extraction and this needs to be sort of um, developed when you're thinking about the, the more complex kinds of learning analytics you might want to report upon. So a lot mm -hmm. of the work that's been going on in XAPI at the moment has involved a lot of counting and bar charts and things. But most of the state-of-the-art research that's been going on in learning analytics is to do with things like discourse analytics or metacognition or group dynamics reflection. So these higher higher level cognitive processes, um, we, we can only really develop these kinds of complex analytics describing these processes if we put a lot of thought into how the data is stored right at the outset because otherwise everything's going to be a big mess. So the, the project is starting to think a lot, of, a lot about these kinds of problems um, and hopefully develop some solutions to them as well. Mm -hmm. So for example, back to the recipes concept, um, when you're looking at multiple social media sources, um, you can get into a lot of problems. Uh, 
uh, very quickly. So for example, YouTube versus Vimeo, if you've got two different developers developing XXEI statements for those two different um, two different sources and they use a different verb set, then suddenly it's very hard to aggregate um, mm -hmm. the data across two different um, resources. And this problem only becomes bigger as you move across multiple social media. So very early um, in this project, we put a lot of effort into creating a recipe for um, social media. Uh, and we're, this is only partially done. We're still extending this common vocabulary. Mm -hmm. um, but essentially what we've got is some, some standard formats for microblogging, content creation, and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. There's a paper that's currently under review for the Learning Analytics and Knowledge Conference. Um, there's a, uh, well, you can look for the title <laughs> if, if it is accepted. But this, this paper talks a lot about the lessons we've learned about using recipes in XAPI. So uh -huh. um, it did actually provide a lot of background details of, of what's actually been important for us there and how thinking a lot about the recipes at the outset has actually really helped the project along um, as we've gone. So for example, we spent, I think, about Oh, well, probably six months thinking about the data mappings and things and then actually getting to the recipe forming, which it still hasn't been officially published, but it's, it's fairly stable now. But having done that, we could actually generate reports within um, a couple of weeks of work. So Anisha, who's uh, doing a lot of the development work, actually was able, once we had the recipe, to sit down and pull the data out and create quite complex reports very quickly. Um, and I'll show you some of the dashboards we have already working now from that process. Mm -hmm. So we have the data. We've aggregated it from our social media sources. Um, we've stored it in a learning record store. Um, we've we've extracted the data using the social media APIs and we've stored it in a learning record store. So now what, what can we do with it? Um, the first thing that happens once you've got to this learning record, once you've actually collected this data, is you, you realize that the XAPI specification doesn't actually have very sophisticated querying functionality. Mm -hmm. So really a learning record store is just a giant log file. It doesn't provide you with a lot of analytics capabilities um, by itself normally. So some of the more advanced um, learning record stores have analytics functionality um, built in, but this is not really part of the standard per se. So, um, and this is actually a problem that a lot of people in the learning analytics community have had with using XAPI. So we all collect the data, we put it in a learning record store, and we think that we can now perform analytics on it. And then everyone suddenly realized, oh, wait a minute, we, we can't. <laughs> so the, right. the specification is quite hard to, to do novel analytics with. So, so the solution we've come up with is we're using PostgreSQL for, um, because it actually has a very nice format for performing SQL like uh, mm -hmm. queries on JSON objects. So that, that's mm -hmm. provided a good solution for us. Um, as, as more LRSs come along with more sophisticated learning analytics functionality, this, this may be this may become less necessary, but at the development stage, it's been quite important for us to have a, a, a higher level data warehouse effectively that we pull the data out of the LRS on and then do the analytics on that higher level um, database. I see. Uh -huh. um, so once we've got that data, then what we can do is we can construct a number of analytics um, reports and dashboards for the for the purpose that you're actually generating the, the well, okay, <laughs> let's start that again. So, so once we've got that warehouse, we can construct some some nicely fit for purpose analytics and dashboards for whatever the learning context is that you're using your XAPI system. Right. Um, so at this point, I might. Well, so like, so what we've got at um, the moment with the toolkit is a number of dashboards. Cool. But I might just out of the presentation and go and show you um, a live feed of these, uh, what we've got at the moment. Oh, here. Uh, here am I. So here I have um, uh, essentially the, the project team uh, system. Well, so what we have, let me go back. Um, at, at the main sort of instructor facing dashboard, there's a number of um, units that different people have registered for. So I'm, I'm I have status across all of the different um, all of the different courses that people have enrolled in. So at the moment, we've got three live systems. Um, if I drop into the project team, uh, you you see that there's actually Twitter and fa and Facebook data being collected for this one. Um, mm -hmm. We're not actually linking a YouTube channel to this one. Uh, but we used YouTube for the Alassi workshop, which is why that exists. Oh, we're not. No, anyway, we are actually. Oh, okay. 
forget that we are linking YouTube. <laughs> so if I if I drop into the social network analysis um, report for all platforms for the project team, you can see mm -hmm. here straight away an activity dashboard of what's been going on with the project. Mm -hmm. um, so you can and what you can see here is an aggregation of Facebook posts, um, YouTube posts, and also Twitter posts over mm -hmm. over the team. So you can actually so so here for example we see a peak or a spike in the activity. This was actually a point where a number of the project team members signed up to the toolkit and so mm -hmm. there was a, a big spike in activity as um, Shane Dawson and I and Abelardo mm -hmm. were tweeting to each other and they were learning how the data collection is working within the format. Right. Here we have another bit more activity to do with the, um, the Alassi workshop that was on last week uh, in Sydney. So if we what we can do is we can actually filter so we can drill down and look at more complex or look at um, more specific sort of time frames and we can mm -hmm. also filter widgets for that particular date selection i won't do that at the moment because i'll show you the whole social network so here we here we have the social network that's being generated by the project team oh. um, we can zoom in and out a bit um, i can also turn off particular features. So if I want to get rid of the shares, I can um, clean up the representation of that network a little bit, which oh. will make it easier to drill in and out. But let's put that back on. Um, so what you find here is um, people who have read are actually people with instructor status in the toolkit. So the project team members all have instructor status. So they read okay. blue notes of the students who've enrolled in this system. And um, anyone who's white is someone who hasn't actually signed up for the toolkit. So the data collection is not happening with them. Um, okay. What you also um, find here uh, is you can actually click on a specific link and you can see what led to that interaction. So you can actually drill down and explore, um, explore the actual social interaction that led to that link forming. Oh. Um, one of the future avenues we'd like to develop is um, some sort of semantics on the nature of that interaction, but um, that's not yet implemented. So I okay. can also see exactly what that particular node has contributed to the network there. So this is Simon Buckingham Chung and a lot of his tweets showing up by the looks of it. Um, so that's the social network analysis we have at the moment. I, I'll, I'll filter that. Let's have a look at a more specific date selection and what's been going on. Actually, let's change it to the Alassi workshop. So I can actually filter the social network down to a more specific time period, which then shows oh. me much more detail there as well. Okay. Um, so there's a fair bit of sense making um, that you can go through there. Uh, if I go to the activity, Stream, I see more details about what people have been posting to in terms of Facebook versus Twitter versus um, like so the different platforms and then also the different activities that have been contributing to the or have been leading to that data set. I can oh. also see individual students and I can sort them on frequency of posts or likes or whatever. If I go into an individual student and click on their um, their name. I can also see the student-facing dashboard. So this is this is what a, a student um, in the toolkit sees at the moment. Um, what you actually see here, if we compare the social network analysis with what we had for the instructor-facing dashboard, you see a very boring, um, essentially an ego network. That's not actually to do with the, the functionality of the toolkit per se. That's actually to do with our ethics application. Um, so when we applied for ethics for this research project, we said we'd only show students um, information about their own interactions. So this is showing me about how I've interacted with all the people in the system, but it doesn't show me how those people are interacting with each other. Okay. Um, and that's actually a bit of a weakness, we think, at the moment in terms of, like, it's actually very interesting for students to be able to see um, how different people are interacting um, in terms of the, the broader pattern. So we're thinking about going back and revisiting that ethics application and um, asking for a variation. But mm -hmm. I think it, it serves to highlight the, the danger with a lot of this stuff. You actually have to be quite, um, you do have to be quite considerate when when you're asking students to actually participate in social activities about you know how they're going to feel about those reports. So for example, if someone is sort of showing up as a completely unconnected node, that might actually lead to some quite perverse outcomes. So you might actually find that student being demotivated by that kind of report. So you do have to be quite 
careful about how you actually report this kind of data. Mm -hmm. um, if I go to the content analysis, I think it's working. <laughs> I hope it's working. <laughs> well, yeah. We have, a, so at the moment we have a sentiment analysis um, uh -huh. going on. Um, we've actually just updated our back end. So some of the labels for some of these are um, changed, which is why this report for community of inquiry is not showing up at the moment, but I'll show you one of those in a minute. Okay. Um, we've got a topic model explorer. So this allows you to look at um, what kinds of themes are coming up in the different topics that students are talking about. So this is using non-negative non matrix factorization. Um, mm. It looks like uh, to, to essentially break down all of the different posts that are in this data set into a topic plus the weighting of that topic to, uh, the, no, so what it's doing is it's breaking down all of the data into a matrix which is essentially talking about for each post, um, how well does that post contribute to a, a specific topic. We can change the number of topics here and what you'll find is the, the um, back end analysis will make more sense as you choose a sort of a nice number of topics. Oh, so for example yeah. here, we have people talking about Anisha um, and the work she's been doing. And that's a very clear topic in topic three. Um, there was a lot of, uh, this is also um, quite closely correlated to Ascolite, which is a, a conference that was just on this week as well. Whereas up here we have what looks like a lot more work on learning analytics as a topic. But, but look, what? there's quite a lot of overlap with those uh -huh. two topics, learning analytics. So it hasn't actually split across those all that clearly. Whereas up here, we have a lot more about dashboards and the toolkit and the project itself. So you, you start to see the, the kinds of themes of um, discussion that are appearing in, in this particular data set. And down here, we see what Simon, Simon Buckingham Shum talking about Ascolite, talking about learning analytics. So there's there's sort of a theme that's emerging out of it. And what we can do now is we can look at the sentiment in each of those topics. Mm. So red is negative sentiment, um, blue is positive sentiment, and then yellow is sort of neutral sentiment. And these are actually starting to cl cluster in terms of their thematic relatedness. So so this this um, chart will get much more interesting as we have. Um, as we have a bigger data set forming here. Um, yeah, interesting. Okay, so I think that's all of my dashboards that I could show you at the moment. Let's drop back into the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what we have. Um, so, so at the moment, um, that's that's the current status in terms of what we have. Um, we're we're rolling out extra functionality, and I just want to talk about some of our current avenues in terms of what we're doing with the, okay. the toolkit at the moment. Mm -hmm. So one of the real real themes for current research is about returning data to the human. So how can you put the human who's learning into the loop? Um, mm -hmm. So when you're doing a lot of machine learning, a lot of the work in machine learning tends to sort of um, essentially tell a human what they are rather than giving them a chance to interact with the, the process. Um, and this is actually a problem when you think about learning analytics. Um, so for example, if I think about cognitive presence, if you're using machine learning to actually classify the behavior of a person, um, uh -huh. this, this is actually quite difficult to do in learning because what you find is learning is a highly contextual um, activities. So yes. if you're in a different class or you're speaking a different language or yes. you're perhaps um, working with a different group of people, you're going to find very different behaviours forming. And so it's it's quite hard to find a data set that you can train a classifier on um, in such a way that the classifier will perform robustly in a different scenario. Uh -huh. So for example, cognitive presence um, is a, a sort of a a construct that's used to measure how people are participating in a community of inquiry. So this is very relevant to social learning and in, mm -hmm. in particular connected learning. So what, what we've got here is a, a dashboard um, that shows how cognitively present, um, well, shows um, learners participating in a learning activity. And what, what you do in cognitive presence is you look at how people are actually um, evolving through different stages of what's called cognitive presence. So what, what you find is somebody might trigger a discussion by asking mm -hmm. a question mm -hmm. and then someone else might sort of explore that question and expand upon it a little bit. Someone else might do that again. You might get a few 
few posts that are exploring mm. this issue a little bit. So asking questions, thinking about things, bringing in new resources. Um, and then gradually what you see in a, a highly functional community of inquiry is people will gradually start integrating those ideas and they'll start forming some sort of more unified understanding of maybe what the solution to that question is or maybe some sort of an, a model or an idea that they can work from. Mm. And that generally then leads to some sort of a resolution. So the issue is sort of seen as solved. Um, and what you can do is you can classify um, learner behaviour in, say, a Facebook, um, just a, a series of Facebook discussion posts or maybe a, a series of responses to a blog post. And you can you can actually look for features in those posts and you can classify the learner behaviour. And if you do that, you get things like this. So this, this is actually a community of inquiry report that was run from a set of um, a set of posts to a YouTube discussion forum and uh, during the Alassi workshop. And what you see uh -huh. here is there's a lot of people triggering. Um, uh -huh. There's a little bit of exploration, but not very much at all. And there's also, you know, blah, blah. So, so essentially what we've done is we've trained a classifier um, and we've run it on this new data set. But the, the classifier was trained on a data set that wasn't collected for YouTube. It was actually collected using Moodle discussion forums and it was collected oh. in Canada, whereas the, the actual activity took place in Australia using this YouTube discussion forum. And mm. actually what you find is the classifier is not performing very well. So there was actually a lot more exploration and integration going on. And if you oh. go through the data set and you um, hand label or so hand code um, what's been going on in that discussion, you find that this, this classifier is wrong. <laughs> so it's, it's not performing very well, it's not very accurate. Okay. Um, so so the, there's a problem of translation, and because there's not a lot of data sets that you can use in constructing these educational um, models, uh, it's actually very hard to actually um, start doing learning analytics because you don't have a, a widely available set of publicly available data that you can train things like classifiers on. So mm -hmm. one, one of the solutions to this that we've come up with just recently, this is another paper that's under review for LAC16, so keep an eye out for it. Um, is we've built what's called a um, we've we've built essentially a, an active learning squared tool. So this 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 allows um, so that this allows a student to learn while the machine is learning based on mm -hmm. the, the student interactions with the classifier. So what we do here is we let the we let a student enter a an activity where they get told very quickly, they go through a very mm -hmm. quick tutorial about cognitive presence and the, the different stages of cognitive presence. And then they go and they actually get to see their discussion forums. So here these these are, they get to see their discussion posts. So here we have a set of, um, here we have a student who's actually responding to a WordPress post. Mm -hmm. And what we see here is um, the post was just, the post was classified as a triggering post. Mm -hmm. And the student is actually looking at it and going, oh, okay, it's not necessarily triggering. It looks like it's actually more of an exploration post. And so they can actually hand classify that post oh. and reclassify it for the, for the classifier. And so okay. what this is doing is this is allowing us to train students to think about their participation in the community. Mm -hmm. as well as generate a highly contextualized data set that will mean our classifier is much more accurate for um, the new posts that come in from this particular community. Mm -hmm. so, so this kind of work is very important to us at the moment because it's much more about um, returning data to the learner and giving them constructs to think about how they're participating and change their behavior accordingly if they're not happy with their behavior. Um, right. It also lets us build um, much more accurate classifiers that are trained specifically for that community. So we can then do much more sophisticated things off the back of that. So this is something that we're just rolling out now. We're just testing the tool a little bit and we're going to actually try it in a, um, a class situation in um, 2016. Mm -hmm. And what we'll be doing is we'll be letting students learn about their um, participation in the community right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And we're hoping that going to mean that students actually head more towards this integration and resolution um, sort of phases of cognitive presence rather than staying up in the sort of triggering phases which is much more um, common in student communities of inquiry. Um, mm -hmm. Another avenue is discourse analytics. So trying to look at um, the nature 
well, trying to look at the um, uh, trying to look at the content and trying to um, help students to understand the nature of their writing. So, for example, mm -hmm. if you've got students writing a reflective post in Facebook, um, this is this is a um, if, if you've got a student writing a reflective post in Facebook, we we could get them to look at um, that post from a semantic processing um, from a semantic processing perspective, mm -hmm. and to think about the how reflective that post was. So, this is a dashboard that was developed by a student of mine called Andrew Gibson. Um, he's mm -hmm. just finishing his PhD right now, um, and what this what this dashboard does is it um, analyzes reflective text and shows um, how reflective that text mm -hmm. was in a way. So what it does is it highlights features. Oh, where's my wait? I'm sorry, <laughs> my mouse has disappeared. Where's my mouse? <laughs> it's completely disappeared. Okay. <laughs> so so okay. what this what this mm -hmm. tool does is it lets students see what was um, what was reflective and how um, how different parts of their post were, were reflective. So, for example, mm -hmm. here we see um, the third sentence in a reflection was actually um, classified as having some reflective characteristics, uh, and the the nature of those reflective characteristics is highlighted and then also tagged um, as sort of indicative of different levels of um, levels of re reflectivity. Um, so this this tool is freely available. If you want to play with it, you can go to that the link up there, which okay. I can't print it because my mouse is okay. broken. <laughs> mm -hmm. And and you can you can explore um, you can explore that tool for yourself. So this this dashboard is something that we'd like to incorporate in the toolkit um, next year as well. It's been declared open source by Andrew already, so we'll we'll be pulling this in next year. Um, uh -huh. So if you want to get any more information about the project, uh, I suggest you go to the Beyond Elements web pages that we've set up for it. Um, there's an ongoing series of blog posts that we are posting, as well as details about the project and where it's at as it evolves. Um, there's also a possibility to contribute other tools that you've developed to, the, to, to these web pages. So have a look for the instructions there. We're, we're hoping to turn this series of web pages into a, an aggregate way of um, Helping people find out about information for teaching beyond the LMS, so beyond the scope of just this project itself. So thanks for letting me talk to you for however long it was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think it's very cool <laughs> because just like you say, um, students they are all on social media, so that's mm. why we need to go to the wild. Yes, yeah, yes, I really agree with that. Um, so yeah, we can find. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, we can don't. find all the publications and the COA toolkit uh, resource information on this website, right? Yes, yes. So the the papers, because they're under review, they're not up there yet, but they'll be appearing there um, once they're accepted. Um, hopefully, they'll get accepted. <laughs> <laughs> but you can also, if if you'd like to see details about those papers, feel free to contact me um, via Twitter or email, and I'll, I can always send you the the submitted papers for more details before they're published. Yeah, um, I I definitely want to uh, look into the paper, the Active Learning Squares. Um, I think it's a very exciting avenue. I'm very mm -hmm. excited about it. <laughs> yeah. I really agree with you that uh, return data to learner and let them participate in this process. They are not a passive role in here. Yeah, exactly. I think there's there's been too much of a focus on um, manipulating people in the mm -hmm. background. So yeah. you classify them and then you send them down some sort of adaptive learning pathway maybe, but they actually have no agency or control in that manipulation. Yes. I actually yeah. think learning analytics has much more potential as an enabler. So it, if, if we actually take learning analytics very seriously and we treat it as a, a way of helping people to understand their own processes, then it becomes a very useful resource for, and it becomes a very enabling technology rather than a, um, rather than one that is a bit, I guess, um, a bit more aimed towards spying on people and telling them what they are. I'm not very, I'm not very interested in that kind of work. So yeah, I, th I think the the true value will come from helping people to understand their own own processes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for long time, of course, we can do uh, analytics on 
um, all the at all the backend, but um, at the first hand, you can return this data to learner mm. to have them mm. look at the pattern and participate in this process. Mm. It's and very meaningful. Well. Uh -huh. Yes, and if you think about the way society is going, it's going to be more and more dependent on data. So teaching people to think about data um, right. is going to be more and more important from a learning scenario. Um, and one of the problems then is people find, a lot of people find data very boring. They don't want to look at mathematical models and they don't want to learn statistics and things. But if you can give people information about themselves, they tend to get a lot more interested in it. So. It's a it's a nice hook to give people more of a reason to actually learn about their own um, to learn about data by examining their own behaviour. Yeah, so that was okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, you go. <laughs> <laughs> I think that also depends on how you present the data. Yes. Yes. And I think that that's it. Like so, as people um, get more used to things like um, activity charts and you know uh, some of the reports we've got they'll, they'll want more and so it'll be important that we give people the power to actually um, access that data and then do their own an analysis on it uh -huh. um, but one of the issues we actually have there with using social media is a lot of the terms and conditions for standard social media um, APIs mean mm -hmm. that you well a lot of the terms and conditions for standard social media mean that you can't actually um, give the data to the learners, even though the data is actually about the learner's um, behaviour. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, the Twitter terms and conditions, actually, if you look at the discourse analytics that we're doing, we can only do that because we actually store the, the Twitter um, comments. So, so we actually store the text in, in the learning record store. Um, mm -hmm. Now, that, that's completely legal. We're allowed to do that according to the current terms and services. But if we actually let the learner download that text, that would mm -hmm. essentially be creating a secondary data store off of that initial data store. Mm -hmm. um, and that's actually a violation of the Twitter terms and conditions. So you, you're actually legally bound, uh, well, you're legally prevented from actually giving people the actual Twitter stream that they generated, which I find very problematic. So I think mm -hmm. um, that, that concept of data ownership is going to become more and more important. So if, if someone created a tweet, I think that that person should own the tweet. And we, we need to actually start um, start agitating for a bit of a change there in terms of how social media and how um, data is collected about people at the moment. I think we need to empower people rather than disempower them, which is yeah. what seems to be happening a lot at the moment. Yes. Yeah, totally agree. Um, so this COA toolkit is open source. Yes. Yeah. Right. Um, and it's available on GitHub at the moment. We'll probably um, change where it is. I need to make a proper GitHub project for it, but currently it's under my GitHub account. Um, but yeah, that that may evolve. We'll we'll, we'll leave some signposts <laughs> if it changes where it is, and you'll always be able to find the link to it from the Beyond LMS web pages. Yeah. Yeah. And also your uh, recipe. Uh, you yes. you unify all those uh, control vocabularies and, and recipes also on GitHub. Yes, yeah, but you you can find the links to all of those um, all of those pages on these Beyond LMS web pages. So um, probably the best first port of call is to start at the Beyond LMS web pages and then follow the links through to the GitHub pages because that'll always be up to date in terms of what's there. Uh huh. So um, about the content and analysis, um, uh, let's. Uh, your tool is for English, so if we um, have Chinese content, um, what do you suggest to work with that? I think we we'd need um, well we need different different semantic analysis. So there there has been a bit of um, development in terms of other other text analytics for for other languages, but it, it's uh -huh. not a field that's been widely developed as far as I know yet, and I haven't done very much work in that. Um, but certainly you can do semantic analysis on other other languages. Um, it's just a matter of building up the feature set for that particular language and then developing the analytics and the reports on that basis. Um, so we we would certainly be very interested in seeing what tools other people made in Chinese, for example. <laughs> so then maybe that's a work that we can uh, co collaborate with um, other researchers in Chinese community in future. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely, I think that would be very interesting. Uh huh. Um, 
So um, in this kind of social learning analytics, do you want to know uh, what people do before social interactions or after social interactions? Um, yeah, oh, so we, we are quite interested in the processes involved. So for for example, back to the group work project, you could imagine mm -hmm. um, you could imagine a, a student posting to Facebook saying, "Hey, John, do do something," um, and then John <laughs> goes and actually starts writing the the you know Google documentation for the project. And then maybe John gets back on Facebook and says, "I've done this now. You know, Tim needs to go off and do something else." So you could imagine a whole sequence across the across the group um, that uh -huh. was actually very important to showing that the group was an effective group and was working well together. Um, you can also imagine sequences of events that were leading to better outcomes. So, uh -huh. for example, if if a student um, if a student looks at their well posts say a YouTube comment and then goes and looks at their cognitive presence dashboard and discovers that the post was just a triggering event and then goes back and actually um, goes back and actually generates a more exploratory post or maybe an integrating post, then that would be another very interesting process to be able to pick up. So there's there's a lot of um, potential to do that stuff, but at the moment our data sets are too small, so we're, we don't have a unified enough picture of what's going on to be doing any of that. Um, mm -hmm. We did have a master's student who was looking at a little bit of process mining this semester, so she's she's established the, the feasibility of it. But we, mm -hmm. we need a bigger data set before we can actually do anything very interesting there. I see. Um, my uh, last question is a, a difficult question, I know. Um, uh, can we quantify the analysis of connected learning? I mean, uh, can we quantify its impact and some process metrics? That would be, it, it's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so so we, we actually, um, when, when you think about um, maybe the way people are learning content, con content is something that is essentially testable. So you can imagine somebody going and, you know, learning about the laws, uh, Newton's laws, say, in a physics course, and then they go and they do a test and they find out if they actually do know Newton's laws or not. Um, then they maybe have to write an assignment on the basis of that, or maybe they have to, you know, derive some, maybe they have to derive some results. It, it's a very um, numerically easy thing to find out if they actually understand that a bit. But even that, even with that being said, Eric Mazur, for example, has shown that it's very hard to know that students actually understand. So they can mm -hmm. have very good um, exam marks and still have very little comprehension of what the, the field actually meant. Um, mm -hmm. So, so it, it's quite difficult um, even to, quanti to quantify the acquisition of content knowledge. When you go to things like um, social collaboration or 21st century sort of skills like um, mm -hmm. collaboration and creativity and innovation, these kinds of things, social learning and connected learning, these things are very, um, they are quite hard to actually measure per se. And yeah. this is one of the reasons we've been getting very interested in giving learners tools to actually understand their own behaviour rather than telling them what they are. So, mm -hmm. for example, the, the active learning squared stuff, that that gives students an under uh, gives students an opportunity to understand their behaviour and maybe to modify it um, or maybe to actually claim competency. So you can imagine a student who is performing very well in um, terms of say taking students' posts and integrating and integrating them and then resolving say an issue. Um, you could imagine that student being able to maybe claim some competency in that skill. If a mm -hmm. university or if an institution was offering maybe a badge, then they could, when they had done that a number of times, maybe go and claim that badge. So that's heading towards quantification a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, there's also possibilities for maybe developing metrics, but th these are very hard things to measure. So mm -hmm. um, it's certainly a, a very active area of work in learning analytics at the moment, um, mm -hmm. but I don't feel like we have a, a strong grasp on what um, what a, uh, a good metric is for social interaction at the moment. Uh, certainly when you think about social network analysis, you can measure, for example, someone's betweenness centrality or you know, mm -hmm. so that how they connect different 
part of a network. And so people who are um, people who are very good connectors are seen as very positive in terms of information flow and transfer in an organisation. So this is a very important skill to have, and you can measure that. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem is that person could be connecting a network in, say, a social media environment by posting a whole heap of really dumb messages to people. So they're not actually um, helping the flow of information at all. All they're doing is saying hi to people on Facebook. So mm -hmm. the, um, there's a lot of complexities to measuring these things, but it makes it a very challenging research question. So <laughs> wow. there's, a, there's a lot of work going on in this area and it, it will become much more sophisticated as the years go by. So, yeah, maybe we have SAPI now and we can um, have more granular and different varieties of data compared with before. I agree. Yeah, so that in a way, I mean, this stuff has never been measured, has it? So it's um, the fact that we can actually collect any of this data at all now puts us in a position where we can start asking these questions, whereas traditionally we, we weren't even able to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, since I started to study in SAPI, I, I am always thinking we should have stronger connection between SAPI community and learning analytics community. And mm -hmm. I, yeah, I'm really happy to see uh, your work in here is doing this connection between these mm -hmm. two domains. And well, you're really very welcome important. to come and join us with learning analytics as well. <laughs> 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 I think it's very important. So there's yes. uh, the the type of uh, the the type of data you collect is um, influenced by the type of analysis you want to do. So mm -hmm. if if you have um, if you have people who aren't really thinking about complex analytics you might want to um, create with XAPI, XAPI data, you're only going to ever stay stuck with things like basic counts of completion of events and things, and that's not very interesting. It doesn't really tell people a lot about their behaviour. It's um, used more to sort of check off, um, say, the completion of a training event, and I don't think that's a very good indicator of learning. So, so yes, I, I think it's very important that we get more people thinking about how you can use XAPI in a sophisticated setting um, and that, that will really push the standard forward a lot. Mm 